Hello, welcome to Denon Street. I'm Al. We're here continuing our album of the year series. We're up to 1982. Took an extra week this time because I ended up with a bout of laryngitis last week. So completely out of commission. Couldn't do it, guys. So, uh, but here we are. Um, been reading a lot of the comments. I'm really enjoying the interaction with you guys. I noticed some um, viewers who um, mentioned that there's not a lot of mainstream um, artists and stuff on here. It's not that I don't enjoy any of the stuff, from, you know, mainstream stuff from the early 80s, for sure. I mean, I grew up during that time. Um, it's just that as the years have gone on. Um, these are the acts that I have gravitated towards. And there's a lot of really great channels out there that really cover the more mainstream stuff. Um, so if you're looking for a mainstream one, there's going to be some in here, but for the most part, um, we kind of focus on the more um, off the beaten path, left field type stuff. But judging by the comments in here, it looks like a lot of people are really getting into what we're doing. So without further ado, let's get started. So number 25 is monochrome set with eligible bachelors. Um, this is a really cool um, collection of jangle pop songs, jangly pop songs, whatever you want to call it, whatever. Um, that obviously had must have had some sort of influence on the Smiths. Um, just listening to it, you can hear in the tracks "I'll I'll Scry Instead" and "Ruling Class." If you listen, you can really just imagine Morris singing them. Um, either way, it's a really nice, uh, warm production style that lends itself to the songs. Number 24 is Solid Space with Space Museum. Um, this album has a very interesting and incredible history. Um, so it's basically an indie released cassette back in 1982 uh, by a couple of British kids who were totally obsessed with Doctor Who, apparently. Um, and have, over the years, through the, through the internet age, just gained some sort of like a legendary type status. And during the time it was out, no one even knew about it. It was just kind of like, it, ha it happened like in their neighborhood. <laughs> That's basically it. Uh, um, but it, it's something that I've only discovered within the past like six, seven years. Um, but it's really cool. Um, just to think maybe like Cure and New Order meets Suicide and Gary Newman maybe. But either way, it's a lo-fi, lo-fi classic. And I, uh, if you guys haven't heard it before, check it out. It's really cool. Number 23 is going to be felt with Crumbling the Antiseptic Beauty. Uh, this record contains some of the most pristine, clean guitar sounds of the era. Has a lot of instrumental space on here, but it doesn't really bother me. And normally that does. Uh, but when the vocals are there, there are some very nice uh, vocal melodies by Lawrence on here. Good record. Number 22 is The Gift by The Jam. Um, I've been trying to get The Jam on every one of these so far, um, and they just end up at like number 26, 27. And I really do like The Jam, so I was happy to finally get them on here. Um, this may be blasphemous to jam purists, but um, I believe this is their best record. Um, and I don't even really think it's all that close. Um, one could say it's the bridge between the jam and style council. But uh, it just sounds great to my ears. Um, it might be, uh, it might even be the best thing Paul Weller's ever done. I, I'm going to get blasted for that one. <laughs> it's how, how I feel. Uh, Happy Together, Carnation, Ghosts, all excellent tracks. Uh, the biggest hit, which was a Town Called Malice, is actually probably my least favorite song on the record. Number 21 is going to be Sad Lovers and Giants with Epic Garden Music. This is a very unique band um, to come out of the post-punk scene in the early 80s. Um, very unique sound. Although you can hear like the, you know, with most of the bands in the era, the, the Joy Division and the you know, maybe Echo and the Bunnymen type 
influence in there, but there's definitely a very 60s psych and Beatles influence in there, which gives it a very interesting twist and different from many of the other bands that were out from the era. Colorless Dream and Things We Never Did are probably my two favorite ones on the record. They're probably the most two most so known songs on the record also, uh, but I think with good reason. Uh, great, great songs. Number 20 is going to be The Names with Swimming. Um, this Belgian band was signed to Factory Records by Tony Wilson, of course, and it was also produced by Joy Division producer Martin Hannon. However, if you listen to it, it actually sounds more like 17 Seconds Era Cure more than it does Joy Division, in my opinion, anyway, for the most part. It still does have a little bit of joy, a tinge of Joy Division in certain spots, but um, Discovery, Life by the Sea, and The Fire are all really excellent tracks. Um, along with the very, there is one track on there called The Harmony, which is definitely very Joy Division in, uh, influence. Has a very closer sound to it. Number 19 is going to be Lords of the New Church with their self-titled debut. So here we might have, I guess, would be the first punk super group, I guess, right? You have uh, Stiv Baders from American group The Dead Boys, and you have uh, Brian James from the legendary original lineup of The Damned. Um, this album is full of attitude, full of nasty hooks, full of reverb, um, and this would go on to inspire thousands of Scandinavian sleaze rock acts for decades and there's not a bad track on it which leads us to our number 18 record one of those Scandinavian acts that were influenced by Lords of the New Church uh, Hanoi Rocks with Oriental Beat so this is their third record um, I'll argue this every single time I mention them they are not a hair metal band not a hair metal band uh, they're the greatest glam punk rock group ever, with the exception of maybe the Dolls. Um, just every song in here kills. No Law or Order is, it, it could have been uh, off of any one of the early Clash records. Uh, Sweet Home Suburbia, Visitor, Motivating, the title track, again, it's a great record. And if you're not familiar with them because you've dismissed them, based on the way they look or the categories that they are in in the record stores back in the day. Give them a shot. Great record. Number 17 is going to be Garlands by Cocteau Twins. So here we have the baby Cocteaus, um, raw, largely unformed. Um, you can still hear little um, Cocteau-isms. Um, Liz is forming her singing language here. Um, but for the most part, they wear their influences on their sleeve on this record, and they emulate a lot of their influences, namely the Banshees, Kraftwerk, Wire. Um, but there's still some really great guitar textures on here. And the original bassist, Will Heggie, who went on to form Low Life after this first record, really stands out in this record. His bass playing is very creative. And um, it just, it, it, the songs are actually built around his bass lines more so than it is Robin's guitars. Um, but uh, get used to hearing the Cocteau's names because you're going to be hearing them pretty much going forward all the way up until 1996 or seven when they finished up. So number 16 is Killing Joke with Revelations. The fact that this record's all the way down number 16 is... Um, a testament to how awesome 1982 is for music. I was I was going into in this thinking that this was going to be a weaker year compared to 79, 80, and 81, and it's not. I mean, I had some of these records that are down here at 15, 16, 17. I, I'm, I can't believe they're not in the top 10, but here we are. They're on the list. Though. So, uh, Revelations. This record begins one of the best four album runs of the 80s, in my opinion. Uh, I personally believe that the pandies are coming should be taught to every uh, kid on their first guitar lesson. <laughs> uh, 
it's 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 absolutely terrifying riff uh have more terrifying to me than any heavy metal riff uh long live jordy great album number 15 is going to be avalon by roxy music which i again can't believe it's slow but but i'm gonna stop saying that um so although i greatly prefer the 70s art rock roxy to the 80s i do enjoy the uh the slick shiny produced records of the, the 80s um this one in particular was copied by about like i got 50 or 60 other bands you know your uh spendal ballets your abc all those bands that were sprouting up in the early 80s um that were eventually put into that sophistapop category um and I think this record was also the launching point probably for Brian Ferry's career because the next couple of records were directly derivative of Avalon. Number 14 is The Church with The Blurred Crusade. Uh, first of all, this is one of the best sounding records of the year uh, production wise. Secondly, really, really great songwriting, beautiful guitar tones, uh, beautiful playing throughout. Uh, the fact that this record is somewhat lost to obscurity um, is just crazy to me. Um, it's not unaccessible in any way. It's just great dreamy jangle pop all the way through. Um, I'd have to do a deep dive on the church, like do a whole album ranking on it. But this record would be way up, uh, way up there. Um, good thing I bought it on CD years ago because a vinyl copy of this is going to cost you an arm and a leg and a couple of teeth to boot. <laughs> no joke. Number 13 is going to be Elvis Costello and the Attractions with uh, Imperial Bedroom. Uh, this record is, did not produce any top 40 hits at the time and it was considered a con commercial failure. Um, but time has been very kind to Imperial Bedroom uh, and rightly so. It truly contains some astonishing songwriting by Elvis. Uh, Man Out of Time and Town Crier are just two of EC's best of all time. Number 12 is going to be Virgin Prunes with If I Die, I Die. Interesting uh, journey I had with this album this week. So I hadn't listened to this one in forever. Uh, it could be because I assumed that I had outgrown it, maybe, uh, because of its it's an extreme record uh, but man was i wrong I, I listened to it it sounds just as eerie and disturbing as, as as i remembered it but as the years have gone on and i've got a little older i listen it's much more creative and intricate than i gave it any credit for back in the day um i get either that or just maybe one over my head um this is one of two albums that really just kind of i rediscovered during this uh journey and what a rediscovery man i mean i, I gavin friday um a great artist googie was a gr uh, great counterpart and um I, I just couldn't believe how much i enjoyed this record i can't believe it made the list and i can't believe it's all the way at number 12 over top of some of these albums that i put up there but man i really really enjoyed listening to it this week and rediscovering it number 11 is going to be the sound with all fall down so um this one proves to me that the majority of the major labels were run by complete morons, especially in the early 80s. Um, so the sound was dropped by their label after this record because they heard no singles. Um, if Monument is not a single, or it would, I mean, how that would not have been a hit if you just put some money behind it, or where is the, or where is the love? Those two, I, I don't know. I just don't get how <laughs> nobody could have heard that there were singles on here. It's amazing to me. Mind-numbingly mind stupid. But uh, whatever. Another great record by Adrian Borland and the gang. Number 10 is going to be Psychedelic Furs with Forever Now. So here the Furs enlisted Todd Rudgren, producer extraordinaire, to enter... Uh, 
to help them enter to their commercial peak. For most bands, that would be a bad thing, right? So, but I mean, with tracks like Love My Way and Sleeps Come Down, Sleep Comes Down, I can't really. I mean, yes, is the edge kind of gone? It's not gone, but is the edge gone from like the first two records? In a way, but I think they found a way to infiltrate the mainstream while not compromising who they really were. Um, not many bands can do that. Right? That's, what, I think, what makes um, the first so unique. And Richard Butler is just a fantastic front man, a great lyricist. Number nine is The Associates with Sulk. I love this record. Um, I there's, there's not anything I can think of that really kind of sounds like this album. It was produced by um, Mike Hedges, who also worked with The Cure and The Banshees during their peak periods also. Um, very good producer, and I think he did a great job capturing Billy McKenzie's voice, which is a, such a such a talent. Um, I don't think anybody else could have turned Gloomy Sunday into a synth pop song and nail it. Um, my only complaint with the record is that the album opens up with an instrumental, which is when you have a singer like Billy McKenzie, why are you opening up the album with an instrumental? Uh, but that being said, um, you can't talk about this record and without mentioning Alan Rankin, who is um, a super talented multi-instrumentalist. Um, and there's some of the songs on here, like No and um, Party, Fears 2, um, Club Country, and Nude Spoons um, are just magical. I mean, this is kind of, it's like a psychedelic synth pop record uh, with just fantastic vocals on it. Number eight is going to be Comsat Angels with Fiction. So uh, the Comsats add a little bit more color to their palette on this one as compared to Sleep No More, the last record, which was much darker in sound. Uh, and it suits them just fine. I mean, it doesn't hurt. Um, more beautiful guitar textures from Stephen Fellows. Monster Drums by Mick Glacier. And alluring melodies, amazing songwriting. Um, and just like the sound for their efforts, they were dropped by Polydor after its release. I hate the music industry. Love this band, though. Number seven is The Gun Club with Miami. So when we were talking about um, Virgin Prunes, and I said there was another album on here that I totally rediscovered during this journey, this is the one. Um, now, I, try, God, I must not have listened to it really but 15, 20 years Maybe I have. I just don't remember it. But like for whatever reason, listening to it just totally resonated with me this time. Not that I didn't back in the day, but I think I, I, I'm hearing it differently. Um, it's Jeffrey Lee Pierce is an amazing lyricist. Um, even if um, he sang sang in the key of Jeff, as bandmate uh, Ward Dotson once br brilliantly put it. Um, it doesn't really bother me. And usually off-key singing is like a, um, just like a major sticking point with me. But for some reason it works. I, I don't ask. I don't get it. Um, but I, I just think the album is very different for its time. Um, it's kind it's it, the influences on it are everywhere. Um, it's like Credence. Joy Division, uh, Pistols, the Stooges, um, Hank Williams. I mean, it's all over the place, and it works beautifully. It's, just, it's a great record. I don't know what you want to call it, Psycho Billy, Cow Punk, or whatever it is, what are Super Cali categories. But um, I mean, I must have listened to it about 15 times in the past couple weeks, um, and it probably cost me <laughs> two, three days in getting this ready because I just kept listening to it over and over. Um, it was really like revisiting a lost, long lost friend and reconnecting more so this time than you did when you were younger. Um, good stuff, Gun Club, Miami. Number six is Theater of Hate with Westworld. This was always a very intriguing record to me. Um, 
I mean, if, if we don't have a Joy Division record to put in this time, <laughs> third time, I think we're mentioning Joy Division. Uh, you hear a bit of Joy Division in here. You hear a bit of The Clash. But not really. I mean, it's not like they're copying. It's it, it's there. Um, Kirk Brandon is just one of my favorite singers of all time. Uh, his voice is like a wild animal on a leash. It's just, just barely contained. Just enough. Um, John Boy Leonard's sax playing is to die for in this record. And it stands out and truly steals the show in a way in certain points in this record. Uh, the record is dark, it's moody, but it's not depressing. Um, it's kind of like a post-punk with with a decidedly masculine twist to it, if that makes sense. Because I mean, a lot of post-punk has a bit of a like a has a femininity to it, um, whereas you know, theater of hate is just full of muscle and testosterone, but not in like a, you know, cheesy way. Um, Mick Jones, The Clash, produces the album and does a great job capturing a great band. Um, and this turned out to be the only album of their classic period, amazingly enough. Kirk went on to form uh, Spear of Destiny after this, so. Theater of hate. Number five is Kate Bush with the dreaming the fact that kate bush was barely 20 years old when she wrote and produced this entire record herself is uh i don't, I don't even know how you put that um when you look at the it's just, when you look at that record through the scope it's incredibly impressive it's not predictable in any way um the songs are they they're challenging but they're catchy and they stick with you. Um, but if you're not ready to be challenged, you're not ready to listen to the dreaming. It's a, um, you're not going to get verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus out. It's definitely some different arrangements, some different instrumentation. Um, and it's just Kate at her peak. Number four is After the Snow by modern english so um this album has ever forever been the i'll melt with you album which is which is a, it's a travesty to me uh this is a masterpiece of the era i mean it's it's up there with the great albums of the post-punk era it deserves to be treated as such um dawn chorus face of wood life in the glad house carrying me down um, all classics. Uh, if you've passed on Modern English and previously and you enjoy The Cure and, you know, the stuff from the late 70s and early 80s, treat yourself. I really check out After the Snow. Number three is The Sky's Going Out by Bauhaus. The third Bauhaus record is their most focused and i think their most cohesive um because some of the other records i mean mask and you have these forays into funk and ska which are cool but i think um with this one they dip their toe a little bit more into like a folk arena uh, there's some more acoustic guitars lots of pianos um more dark brooding soundscapes that you would escape, if, um, expect from Bauhaus. Um, the interplay between Daniel Ash's guitar playing and Daniel and David J's bass lines um, is just perfect. Um, just as an inch, I mean, I, the third Uncle uh, remake, the old Eno song, I think is actually better than the Eno track. It's hard to um, imagine that but it just is i think they made it their own and for a generation of people uh, that's just a Bauhaus song believe it or not uh peter murphy's excellent on this record melodies are beautiful um the lyrics are some of the best of his career uh silent hedges is otherworldly um in the night is scorching all three chapters of three shadows are incredible 
all we ever wanted is magical and i do but i do prefer the single version of spirit to the album version uh both versions are great but um either way love 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 this record so we're here at the top two and um i i had to go back and forth as to which one i was going to put one which one I was going to put two because unfortunately 1982 has two of like my top five or six all-time records in the same year so one of them has to go to number two so number two is going to be pornography by the cure um this record is probably the most <laughs> hopeless and harrowing listen you may ever experience it's an oral hummel <laughs> oral pummeling <laughs> the tongue twister um to call this goth really just kind of makes it sound silly uh it's not silly it's from the opening line of 100 years where robert belts out doesn't it matter if we all die you are warned of what to expect going forward and it doesn't let up for a single second. The wailing sorrow of Robert Smith's guitar, the desperation in his voice, Simon Gallup's throbbing and ominous bass playing, and the tribal punishing thunderous drums of Lull Tolhurst on this record. Definitely uh, Lull's highlight of his uh, drumming career, without a doubt. And it's been copied hundreds of times over. Um, the album has 100 years, like I said, cold, figurehead, strange day. Uh, and my personal favorite, Siamese Twins. Um, a very special relationship with this record. Um, real quick story. Um, one, it, st it started one frigid night in January, I guess, and it was 1993 here in Philadelphia. Um, the day after a nasty snowstorm. I waited in vain for a bus to take me home from a friend's house at around midnight-ish, um, only to have to walk seven miles home uh, by myself with nothing but my parachute boots, <laughs> my black trench coat, my Walkman, my uh, green military bag, filled with probably soda and batteries. And the only tape I had with me that night was a um, dubbed copy of pornography on cassette. Um, I walked those desolate snow covered streets for hours, listening to the album over and over and over again. I felt like I was the last person on earth. And, uh, I fell in love with that record that night and I never let go. Even over 30 years later, it's still the most horrendously grotesque and beautiful thing I've ever heard. And it's number two. So, leads us to our number one, which is going to be A Kiss in a Dream House by Susie and the Banshees. So the Banshees do an about face after the year before they did um the very very dark and disturbing juju with a record that is filled with dream like it's like a dreamlike jamboree of colors and psychedelia this may be suji's finest collection of vocal performances while her bandmates turn in yet another masterful performance the opening track cascade and the side two opener Melt are both in contention for my top five or ten songs of all time. Um, both absolutely magical to my ears and to my heart. Um, Cascade is soaring and sensual with, an ins with insane guitar work by the late great John McGeoch. Melt has a bit of an Italian folk sensibility attached to a tapestry of sound behind it. It's amazing. Uh, Susie's incredibly erotic and 
violent lyrical images. Uh, it just gives me goosebumps every time. Painted Bird comes in at the perfect time to bring an upbeat lift to the proceedings. Another phenomenal guitar riff by, the, by John McGee. Uh, Green Fingers even introduces a recorder to the party. Um, the fact that they pulled this off immediately after Juju is a wonderful testament to their creative fortitude. Sadly, this is the last record to contain this exact lineup, which to me is absolutely heartbreaking because this is my favorite lineup, well, my favorite group. Um, this record is immensely important to me. In my opinion, this is the post-punk Sgt. Pepper's. It's just a psychedelic classic. It's right up there with all the other psychedelic classics and all the greatest albums of all time, in my opinion. It's just beautiful. So there we have it. 1982. Um, so I know I'm going to get it in the comments. So I'm going to just put down some of the records that I listened to. I know I've loved for years and had to leave off. Um, orange juice, Yazoo, birthday party, my birthday party off, dream syndicate, certain ratio, X, Christian death, the clash, Peter Gabriel, the fall, mission of Burma, the dam, gang of four, and cabaret Voltaire. Didn't make the list. 25, I could have, I should have just did a top 50, but it would have been too long. You guys won't watch top 50s. Uh, so there we have it. So coming up, we'll be doing, obviously we'll be doing 1983. Uh, I did promise you guys a Jesus Mary Ching al album listing, including, which will include the new one. Um, we'll be doing that with Dr. Byrne soon. And, um, if you like what you're watched so far, and as you're just joining us, uh, like subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, join us in all of our social media. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I think we started, we're starting a TikTok. I might have my kids help me do that one. So uh, again, thanks a lot. Thanks for watching Dead End Street. See you next time.